My name is Ronnie Piowski with Osborne Consulting. Um, I will be your moderator this evening. Now allow me to introduce Jeff Moss. Jeff is a civil engineer at Murray Smith focused on wastewater and water design, planning and construction projects for municipalities throughout the Northwest. He has experience with the design, construction and operation of pump stations, conveyance systems and treatment plants. Jeff was the lead designer on the Renton Downtown Utilities Project for the sewer improvements, was the lead specification writer for the project and provided engineering services during construction. Now let me introduce Marcus Byers. Marcus has been with Kleinfelder for over 17 years and has over 25 years of experience. He is principal geotechnical engineer and works on a variety of utility, transportation and infrastructure projects throughout the Northwest and Western Canada. Marcus was the lead geotechnical engineer and Kleinfelder's project manager on the DUIP project overseeing Kleinfelder's geotechnical, hydrogeologic, and environmental design services and construction testing and inspection services. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm excited to present this project. It was a pretty complex uh, and I think a very interesting project. We'll be focusing on areas where Murray Smith and Kleinfelder coordinated on civil and geotechnical construction. Uh, and yeah, like mentioned, this is the city of Renton's downtown utility improvements project. Uh, I'm Jeff, this is Marcus. Uh, we'll get right into it. So that we had a, a really large project team for this. Uh, the city of Renton had three utilities that were involved, wastewater, surface water, and drinking water. Uh, we had a fairly large consultant team. Murray Smith was the prime and civil engineer. Kleinfelder provided the geotechnical. Uh, and then we had a bunch of different subs that helped with other portions of the project. Uh, we stayed on the project from the initial conceptual design early on through construction management, which was great because we got to learn a lot of see the construction and take away a lot of lessons learned, which would be part of what we're sharing with you today. Uh, we also coordinated a lot with outside entities, uh, including King County Wastewater, Seattle Public Utilities, and several other um, different portions of the project. Uh, the goals and scope of this project were to replace all the city utilities in the downtown core. So like mentioned, water, wastewater, stormwater. Uh, you can see the project map here. It was very wide ranging. We did work on a total of 20 different blocks. Uh, it was kind of piecemeal, so different utilities in different places. And the idea was to bring all these utilities up to current design standards, improve capacity, and really set the stage for future growth in downtown Renton. Uh, by the time we set the full scope of the project, we had a couple miles of wastewater pipe, both new and CIPP, uh, a couple miles of, or over a mile of surface water pipe, uh, all new with a ton of different structures in different locations, several tie-ins and, and really a lot of complexity. Uh, and then the water was the smallest portion, but still over a half mile of water. The key challenge is that we faced going into this project was four different crossings of Seattle Public Utilities Cedar River pipelines, which are the primary water supply for Seattle and the surrounding suburbs. Uh, the Cedar River pipelines supply most of the south side and central Seattle. Uh, also, we connected in two locations to the King County East Side Interceptor which carries sewage from the east side to the city of Renton plant. Uh, that's a nine foot diameter pipe, so pr pretty significant interceptor. We knew going into the project, we were gonna encounter a lot of groundwater, shallow groundwater. We were aware of areas of contamination. Uh, we knew that the soils would be poor and combined with all this, with the scale of what we needed to do, we we're gonna have some very deep excavations. So we had a lot of concerns about uh, how this was gonna be executed. In addition, on top of all of that, very sensitive surroundings, a lot of history of development in Renton, very old buildings, and a lot of existing utilities. So to dive into it a little bit more, the site history, I think, in, in Renton is fascinating. Uh, the Duwamish tribe has some settlement in the area at the confluence of the Black and Cedar Rivers. The Black River originally drained Lake Washington, which you can see in the left. It drains Lake Washington to the south. Um, the city of Seattle, like I mentioned, installed the Cedar River pipelines in the early 1900s, actually getting started in 1899. I got some cool photos here. Um, I guess I should mention most of these photos are taken from within the project area that, you know, within the scope of what we actually touched. This is at Third and Burnett here. Um, also in the early 1900s, the, there was a lot of hydrologic changes in the area. The primary changes within the project area was a flood in 1911 that happened, which led to the relocation of the Cedar River channel here. Uh, on the right, you can see that channelized section 
And the project area is essentially between that channelized section and the old river on the left. Uh, around the same time, the Lake Washington Ship Canal was opened, which lowered the level of Lake Washington by nine feet that dried up the Black River. So we have the old Black River Channel and the old Cedar River Channel right within our project area and a lot of complex hydrogeology that went along with that. So that's why we brought Connie Feder on to help us out. Thanks, Jeff. So I'm going to talk about the geotechnical and environmental scope. Um, it was really a fun project because it was not straightforward. Um, we were able to come into the project very early on before they actually knew the extents of the project and what would be needed. And we were we took a very much a phased approach throughout the project, kind of working interactively with Murray Smith and the city. I got to work with Kleinfelder geotechnical engineers, environmental engineers, hydrogeologists, and other experts in specification writing and so on. So it was actually really a great project as far as I was concerned, a lot of fun. Um, the first step was a phase one desktop study. So a classic study where we didn't drill any holes. We just looked at available literature. Uh, we focused on geologic maps, existing geotechnical reports. Kleinfelder had done some work just north of this area previously for the city. And we wanted to identify what were going to be the main issues related to soils and groundwater. And then there was an extensive environmental search that went through standard databases identifying potential contaminants. We, we looked at the geo search as well as city and state records and found a number of properties where there were environmental issues. Uh, we, we ranked them basically level one was a site that had an evidence of a release, maybe you know fuel oil spill or something like that. Level two were sites where there was potential impacts based on the site use. Maybe it's a dry cleaner or maybe it's a lube shop or something like that. And then level three were basically no concern. And this study allowed us to then set up a plan for explorations going forward. I just wanna highlight on this map, those, those blue squigglies that you see, you can make them out. Those are the former Cedar River and Black River channels. And you can see on the left side there, the Black River does run through our site. We actually did get a boring that went right through what was filled for the Black River. And this area is also notorious for things like a lot of logs and other debris. So you can be drilling down and hit things that could be really a problematic for a contractor. Uh, phase two was where we did initial exploration. This was a uh, program with seven borings, just basically spaced across the alignment, kind of randomly, if you will. All of those were converted to monitoring wells so we could check groundwater levels throughout the year. And we field screened with a PID. That's sometimes we call it a sniffer, but it's, a, it's called photo ionization detector is the technical name. And that gives you an idea whether you have volatile organic compounds if you get a hit. Maybe you take that sample, put it in ice, and run it to an environmental lab to check. Um, so that was really good for screening initially. What we found was that groundwater was generally about seven to maybe 17 feet deep, and it fluctuated about five feet over the period of a year. Uh, after that, and as the project design advanced, and we started to know where we were going to have the deepest utilities and most critical utilities in that sense, we were able to design then the rest of the geotechnical exploration program. Again, it was combined with the environmental program for efficiencies. We focused on drilling where we had the deepest utilities, as well as areas of environmental concern, where we were again next to those properties on the alignment. Uh, in four locations, we had PID screening where we had hits. So we actually converted those borings to monitoring wells to allow subsequent follow-up with groundwater sampling. In those cases, the cuttings had to be drummed up and stored. We couldn't just put soil cuttings in the ground or just dump them in the old place. We had to take care of them properly. The city didn't really want 55 gallon drums sitting out on the sidewalks, So we transported those to the city's maintenance yard. And then once we had test results back from the lab, we were able to dispose of those properly. So that, that actually worked out really well. Again, this, this phase was heavy on lab testing. And then also we did some aquifer testing and what, with what we call slug testing. And in slug testing, we have usually a two inch diameter well, and we lower a rod down that, and that displaces the water in the well, and it surges it up really high. And then we have a transducer in the well that measures water depth, and we record water depth over time, watch that come down and recover, and then we pull it out, and the same thing happens just in reverse, the water level drops, we record the time for that water level to recover, we repeat that usually about three times, and then through analysis, we're able to basically estimate the hydraulic conductivity of those soils, which is really important for dewatering. And I don't have a laser pointer, so I'm going to step over here one second. I'll speak loud. 
So this is lots of numbers. The bottom line is steady the data here is coming up with the hydraulic conductivity value here. And this is a grain size distribution. And I just want to point out we have soils over here, which are mostly gravel and sand with very little silt and clay. Over here, we have soils, which are mostly silt and clay with just a little bit of sand. So as you can imagine, these soils have very different properties when it comes to hydraulic conductivity and then dewatering during construction. So this just illustrates a little bit of the variability across that site. As phase three wrapped up, we finally had a design level draft report out the door. And then we decided to come back for phase three to do a little supplemental borings to help reduce data gaps with respect to the environmental contaminants. We did uh, two additional borings, five geoprobes, which is just a, ro a rod that's pushed into the ground. You can actually sample groundwater from the tip of that rod. It's fast, it's more economical than borings. And then a lot of lab testing. We had a, about 150 pages of data, tables and tables of environmental data. And I just, I'll note, you see a few boxes with red. Those are areas where we identified contamination at a level such that the material couldn't go back into the ground and couldn't be just simply hauled off to any other site for disposal. It had to be handled specially, taken to a facility that would take contaminated material. Again, the contaminants of concern here were VOCs, volatile organic compounds. Um, it, it wasn't metals and other things that were ultimately problematic. We had a lot of discussions with the city and with, with Murray Smith about how much environmental sampling is enough. As you can imagine, if you have a boring here that says contamination, one here that says no contamination, and now you're trying to estimate quantities of contaminated material, where do you draw that line? Ultimately, we felt comfortable that, that even though we didn't know the answer, we could move forward with the project and Jeff will touch on that. Uh, this is a map that first was developed as part of our phase one desktop study, and then it kept being developed and refined throughout the project. And what you see, there's second and third are kind of in the middle going left and right on the page. The properties in, in red were ones where we there was like an open response required because of known spills, known issues requiring cleanup. The yellow properties were ones that had been identified as potential concern. Maybe there was a known spill, but it had been cleaned up. The regulatory action closed. Um, and so we found four locations on our alignment. Those are the red circles, and they have little tables coming off of them where we said, okay, we've got right on our alignment some issues with contaminated soils, contaminated groundwater. Uh, so this map was really put together to help the project team, the city, and the contractor get their arms around this 150 pages of data. It was up to them to dig in, but we wanted it to be digestible up front so they knew what they were going to have to deal with. We put together one other figure. This was a, a figure representing basically the shallowest groundwater depth at any location that we monitored versus the depths for inverts for various utilities. If you look at KB10 there, GW is groundwater at 13 feet, SS sanitary sewer, 21 feet deep. So in that case, you know, we're going well below groundwater table for sanitary storm drain and uh, uh, water lines shallow enough, not an issue. And for the most part, dewatering was centered along uh, Third Avenue and uh, really focused on sanitary sewer. Right in this area, and we had a little bit of groundwater to deal with down below for, for some storm water. Explorations on the site were really challenging. I was thankful for very patient and detail-oriented field staff who were committed to getting this done. Of course, we had to go through the permitting process and we were replacing three utilities, not to mention the fact there's gas and, and power and fiber and comms everywhere. I, we had to move borings, it seemed like, every time. We'd, we'd do our best guess, look at utility maps, pick a spot, call and locate, and we, we find issues. Um, that, so that was challenging. Also, you notice in the center picture, you can see asphalt over Portland cement concrete. Drill rigs can auger right through asphalt all day. They cannot auger through concrete. So you can imagine when you show up thinking you have asphalt and you have concrete, it's a surprise and it can shut you down. We learned that the hard way early on in the project. And after that, we approached every single exploration with the plan to core it ahead of time. And in addition, in the picture, the large picture on the right, you can see there's the orange fiber, yellow gas, and the crews there, work, they're working with a vac truck. And so we decided to core and then back truck all explorations to make sure we were free of utilities just to ensure we didn't have a conflict. And that meant we had four subs to work with as the geotechnical consultant, traffic control, coring, 
uh, vac truck and a driller, and then a nine to three work window because of permit requirements. So that really slowed production and it did drive up exploration costs. The city understood that and um, they were on board. So we, we did the best we could to keep that moving. We did have, a, you see a no parking sign. More than once we set up no parking at a time and then you show up to, to drill and guess what? Your signs are nowhere to be seen and there's cars parked. So we had a few of those challenges as well. Final design was supporting plans and specs. I was able to bring in um, some client filter expertise to help in final review and writing of those. We wanted to ensure that we had solid specs. The, the contractor was required to have plans for handling the contaminated materials and then surface restoration. And, and Jeff will talk about that, but you can see here just below the trench box, that's a big thick section of asphalt. There's also some brick under that you might see. There's brick pavement out there and really quite a hodgepodge. And we'll get into a little bit about how that went. So the challenge that we faced as we were setting up the bid items uh, and the contract in general was how do you excavate well under a groundwater table when you know it's contaminated, you're gonna deal with contaminated soils, you have a very wide range of complexity because of the links that we're dealing with. Um, and this is a quick summary of our strategy to how we address that. Uh, we'll go into each one of these in more detail to explain our approach. And then, like I mentioned, go into the construction results. Um, but at, from a high level, we did two different shoring items, a non-structural item and a, shoring, a structural item, both by square foot. We did dewatering systems by lump sum, contaminated soil by ton, contaminated water treatment by force account. And then we also included several lump sum items for those connections to King County, as well as the crossings under SPU. Uh, so for shoring, the two items we used were structural and non-structural. These are based off of washdot classifications. Uh, so we leaned on the existing washdot spec. Uh, a structural shoring system is one that's installed prior to excavation. Uh, things like sheet piles, soldier piles would qualify as a structural shoring system. And the key piece is that a structural shoring system provides positive support to the structural, the soil walls and minimal soil movement. So we knew this would be needed in some locations. We were kind of anticipating for a lot of the deeper sewer, they would need some kind of structural shoring system, but that gives them the flexibility to select the means and methods that they will, the contractor wanted to use, while also recognizing that in a lot of places they were going to be able to use trench boxes, and we didn't want to be paying structural shoring prices for non-structural shoring, um, which, yeah, the structural shoring item covers trench boxes. That's more for worker protection. It's not providing any support of the walls, so you can get soil sloughing into the excavation and the trench boxes are really designed just to block rocks from falling on people. Uh, so that's kind of a passive method. And by breaking these out and not lumping it together, we felt that that protected the city from change orders, regardless of conditions. Uh, if the contractor needed to do more structural shoring, there was a bid item for that. And uh, we had a cost set that was set competitively. Uh, Along similar lines, we also included the lump sum bid items for the connections and crossings. Uh, the sewer group decided to go with just the lump sums for each of those. The water group actually crossed underneath the SPU transmission main several times or a couple times. Um, and they went for a linear foot bid item for the casing. And they felt like because the casing was only going to be used when they were crossing under SPU, that was an appropriate place where the contractor could put money. Um, and that was one of the benefits of breaking out the bid items into different schedules for each utility. So we actually ended up with uh, over 150 different bid items uh, once we broke it out by utility, but that helped both the budgeting side for each of the utilities manage their budget uh, and also helped with different approaches based on utility preference. Uh, so the King County connection at Third Street, this is kind of what it looked like here. Uh, you can see the plans on the right and a photo of the area on the left. We were connecting at about 35 feet deep. Uh, and if you look really closely, just to the right of that clock tower, kind of behind the lamppost, there's a manhole cover. That is the King County manhole, uh, where we needed to connect 35 feet deep. King County would not let us connect to the pipe, which ran across the intersection. It had to be at a structure. So our task was to figure out if it was even feasible to connect that deep at that location, especially given the proximity to the bank and the clock tower. Uh, what we ended up suggesting to the contractor, we identified the clock tower. You can see that, that there. We wanted to make sure it was really clear that they needed to figure something out there. But again, 
didn't want to get into means and methods. So they removed the clock tower, temporarily stored it in the yard, uh, installed the excavation or shoring system. Uh, here's a couple photos of that. It's a slide rail shoring system, which uses uh, piles that are installed prior to excavation. So it's a structural shoring system. And then those blue panels are slid down as the excavation goes to support the walls. Uh, these are a little bit fish-eyed, so it actually kind of betrays the, the true scope of the excavation, but you can see in that middle photo that it's big enough that they could fit a mini excavator in the excavation. Um, and then in the photo on the right, you can see how close we were to the bank. That's actually the bank that the city of Renton uses for their banking. Uh, so we were really, in addition to not wanting to mess anything up, we really wanted to make sure that that relationship was uh, intact after the project. Um, and we were about 17 feet from the front door uh, and that they stayed open. That was their, you know, their primary entrance and they stayed open the entire time during construction. Here's another photo of the coring. So again, that's 35 feet deep coring into a manhole structure that's I think it's about 60 years old. Uh, that went really well. They did, we did coordinate with King County both during the design, coordinated with some subcontractors to in the design phase to make sure that our idea was feasible. Uh, and they executed that quite well. They did have a little bit of coordination with King County in terms of flows. The interceptor flows can't be interrupted because of the size and scale. So that had to be timed pretty carefully to uh, tap into that pipe while it was live, uh, but it worked well. The SPU crossings were another area of big concern for us. Uh, as you can imagine, again, that required coordination with SPU. They let us know that the pipes were backfilled with pea gravel which is a concern because that'll unravel on the contractor really easily. It doesn't stay in place if you excavate it. Uh, we did assume based off of discussions with the city and with SPU on previous experience, they'd seen open cuts done successfully uh, in these areas. We were considering requiring trench list, but decided to bid open cut as a basis, um, included this plan for a temporary pipe support uh, in the appendix of the contract documents as kind of a suggestion to the contractor, here's something that will work. We know it's feasible. You can use this, but again, not getting into means and methods, we left that kind of open-ended. Uh, we did require a, a submittal of a plan for how they were gonna address this, which gave us some leverage uh, when they proposed an alternative method. What they wanted to do was jack and bore. And because we had that submittal review process, we were able to look into the details of that. Like I mentioned, that was a, a mechanism that we thought they might elect to go with. So we weren't terribly surprised to see that. And we built the specs with that in mind to give us a little bit of leverage to require the contractor to, to go about that, how we, how we thought was uh, appropriate. And we coordinated with Kleinfelder, coordinated with the city, SPU of course reviewed that, and that helped us all get on the same page. Um, the crossings went well. You can see in the, the photo on the right is actually a snip from my email from our construction inspector. And I, I know it's hard to read, but the first line of that is, we will not make the news tonight, uh, which was great news. That helped me sleep easier. And I really appreciated that update. Uh, and it was all in all, it went really well. SPU was quite happy with, with the results uh, and the contractor did a good job in these locations. So the, one of the other big challenges was that deep sewer install on Third Street. Again, a lot of dewatering there, uh, 15 to 25 feet deep, drawdown in places up to about 20 feet, and right next to the historic buildings, masonry structures, right? So they're settlement prone, you know, crack easily, et cetera, and a lot of utilities to protect. So we, we thought a lot about this section and how that would be dewatered. So in the in the specs, we required that they draw down the water two feet below the bottom of the trench, pretty standard requirement so that you have as stable of a trench bottom as, as practical, even in poor soils. The contractor doesn't do that. You're gonna have a muddy mess and they're gonna probably come to you for extras saying it's unsuitable and you know you need to pay me. And it's like, well, you just need to dewater properly. The flip side though, is that we wanted to limit drawdown to about 10 feet below what we thought the historical groundwater lows were so we would minimize settlement on this. So kind of threading the needle on that, uh, this section relied back on those hydraulic conductivity estimates we talked about because we were estimating dewatering flows. That needed to be done to support permitting in the talks with King County. 
as well as the contractor had to have some idea of how much flow they are going to need. You know, do they need a small pipe, a big pipe, et cetera? And it, you'll see if you look at the numbers, we had in one case estimated flows, daily flows. This is for a hypothetical 100 feet of trench dewatered, 7,200 gallons per day, up to about 6 million gallons a day. That's a why I mean that's a wild swing. I was talking to the hydrogeologist, like, are you sure about that? You know, but yes, it all checked out. And in the end, we did have some really high flows. Um, other things on dewatering spec, again, it was a lump sum bid per utility. So water, wastewater, drinking water, sedimentation tanks were included in that. Settlement monitoring was incidental, as was vibration monitoring. We thought they might install sheets. We were a little concerned about that. We require that they use a variable uh, oscillator, oscillating hammer if they go with sheets because that causes less settlement, wasn't an issue. Um, and again, settlement was monitored throughout. We really ended up doing well on that. And again, back to uh, submittal review, that was a little bit of a challenge, but we had enough teeth in the spec that we got what we needed. Their first submittal was essentially uh, probably non-responsive, you could say, because they just planned widely spaced deep wells right down the street. So that would have definitely been a, a settlement risk. And really, I think I, I credit the fact that the city was very open in terms of how we communicated. We had a call with, with Murray Smith and the city, the contractor, their dewatering sub and the dewatering designer. And so we got to talk through really what are the key issues? What are the approaches we could accept? And, and we're able to come then to a, a pretty reasonable uh, approach. And that ended up being uh, well points. On the photo on the left, you see the white pipe running down. That's a vacuum header that's under vacuum. And the little hoses coming off all go down to well points down in the ground right along the alignment there on third. That machine is actually grinding up the asphalt in preparation for doing the excavation work. And you can see that white pipe is down in a little shallow trench. The photo on the right shows the vacuum pump system that that header is tied to. And then looking here on the left, you can see the steel plates covering that trench up. Great setup because now they could open the road and maintain traffic because you see on the right, kind of the mess of pipes that we really have. This was running to the, the Baker tanks there for sediment control on that system. This is a little video of one of those well points. Will it play? <laughs> one more time. There we go, okay. And so you can see the water kind of gurgling up that's under vacuum. Notice the, there's bricks and all of the good stuff we have there below ground. That pipe runs right along down towards that yellow um, bin in the in the distance, and there we are digging 20 plus feet deep in Third Avenue successfully with that. Just going to talk about some lessons learned. So we do have a couple of lessons learned that were uh, given to me by our construction manager from the field. Uh, the biggest one on the dewatering was the extra gravel and asphalt quantities, uh, and there were a few things that contributed to this. A big one was because that dewatering trench was dug along the side of the excavation and because we left the, the selection of dewatering methods open to the contractor, we hadn't really included that volume in our initial estimates for the bid. So we went quite a bit over just because of that. In addition, like I mentioned, we were anticipating areas of structural shoring. Uh, but like you can see here, they use trench boxes really all the way down third. The only place they did structural shoring was for that connection to King County. Uh, and the result of that was, as you can see, they had a lot of sloughing off of the trench walls and a, a wider area of disturbance that we had anticipated. We did attempt to account for the geometry to, to include some of that, um, but it was more than we expected, uh, in part because of poor soils, also in part uh, the road subgrade was very poor and you can see in a lot of locations there wasn't really any subgrade we had uh, in some spots bricks that are probably close to 100 years old laid directly on the ground overlaid with asphalt like you saw before we had areas with concrete on asphalt it was just all kinds of stuff uh, in one location they found like a, a huge void um, underneath the, the in the concrete panel was just spanning over it uh, with a couple feet of void underneath. So in the end, these cost overruns were shared between the city and the contractor. Um, the city recognized that to some extent, the overruns were unavoidable, but also the contractor selected the shoring system that they did. Uh, it allowed them to work more quickly. And so they, they took some of the cost too. And then as well, the city streets department worked uh, to cover and add some additional subgrades. So we went about 40% over on that in the end. Uh, that was a couple hundred thousand dollars. 
And uh, we certainly could have been a little bit more conservative on that. Uh, you probably are noticing we've talked a lot about dewatering, but didn't get into contaminated soils and water yet. Uh, that was a whole nother layer on top of this uh, that we'll talk about briefly. We had soil sampling and testing for each to allow the city to direct the contractor to collect samples as needed. Like I mentioned, we did the soil excavation, haul and disposal by ton, and then contaminated water treatment by force account. Uh, if you think back to the dewatering bid item, that included sedimentation tanks. So this contaminated water treatment was really just focused on hydrocarbon treatment, uh, stuff like granulator activated carbon, sand filtration, et cetera, to bring those contamination levels down. Um, the contaminated soils, based on the geotech data that we had, we made our best guess based on volume interpolation for where we thought the areas of contamination were. Uh, we knew that this is a bit of a risk going into the bid because you don't really know what you're going to get until you start to dig. So we set the quantity such, it was, we wanted to make sure it was high enough that we were getting realistic bids and the bidders couldn't play with that quantity and load it so that if we had overruns, it blew the project budget. Um, we also required, again, submittals to review the testing plan that was implemented well. The contractor opted to excavate directly and into trucks and go straight to waste where there was contamination. It didn't require a whole lot of testing to determine when soils were contaminated. The odor is extremely strong. Um, there's a noticeable sheen. So the city construction managers were comfortable assessing that primarily by odor and visual. Uh, after a little bit of testing to establish the, the benchmarks. Uh, and in the end, we more, hit more than double the estimated quantity. Like we, again, we knew this was a risk, but it's, it's unfortunately unavoidable uh, in these kind of areas. Contaminated groundwater was, I think, a little bit higher concern. Actually, we did do a lot of permitting and coordination ahead of time to the greatest extent we could. Uh, we knew we were going to have fl high flow quantities, like Marcus mentioned. Uh, so dewatering is is regulated under the Ecology Stormwater General Permit. They have benchmark hydrocarbon contamination limits that are fairly low. King County, the industrial discharge program will accept construction dewatering with higher levels, but there's still a limit. Uh, and we weren't sure exactly where we would fall. The preliminary data was kind of between those limits. So we thought we would be able to go to King County, but we knew there was a risk that we would hit areas of higher contamination. And that's why we did the force account item. Uh, it wasn't fair to put that risk on the contractor because it, there's really no way of assessing it and it would have inflated the bids. So we felt force account was the best way to go with that item. Uh, we ran into a couple issues here, the storm drain capacity being one with flows over a million gallons per day. We couldn't discharge to the storm drain because we just didn't have capacity in those pipes. Uh, also logistically, it's challenging to switch between sewer and storm depending on contamination and flows. So ultimately what the contractor did is when they were dewatering, they went to King County, went to the sewer for about three months while they were in the contaminated zones and then later switched off of that when we were out of the contamination areas. One thing that became an issue as, as we got further along in the project was the cost to meter to King County. The bid item was written so that all the permitting fees uh, testing, et cetera, for contaminated water was on the contractor. They had to pay for that, but we were vague on the fees that King County charges Renton to accept water. So King County provides treatment that flows uh, from Renton and there's a standard metering rate. And that's not really part of the permit, but if you're sending a million plus gallons per day, that's a very significant cost. Uh, it ended up being $276,000 total and we weren't very clear in the specs on who was supposed to cover that. In the end, the city decided it was fair for them to absorb that cost. It was certainly the most cost-effective, uh, much more so than paying force account for additional treatment to bring those levels to underneath the ecology limits. Um, but it, it could have been more clear. And my advice would be, if you're in a similar situation, make sure you're thinking through some of those hidden costs. Uh, we had a couple other construction lessons learned. I think. I'll skip these because we're just about out of time uh, to cover the current project status. So we're very close. The contractor's working on the punch list now. We're at $13.2 million. Uh, at the time of bid, we went in with an engineer's estimate of $14.9 million. And the average of our seven bids was just under that at 14.8. So we'll certainly finish well below the average, uh, which has everybody feeling pretty good. 
Um, the construction management team has been a huge benefit. We've mentioned a few times the coordination between the city, Murray Smith, the contractor, Kleinfelder. Uh, that's been a really key portion and all the submittal reviews that we built in were really helpful to give the contractor the flexibility to do means and methods and determine how they wanted to approach things, but also give everybody leverage to require the contractor to adjust based off conditions and what we felt was appropriate. Um, and overall, the contractor for this project has been really good. We're working with Scarcella Brothers or SCI. Um, they've, they've maintained a great relationship with the project team. There's been a few things that have come up, but we've worked through them. Um, and one big bonus uh, uh, that Scarcella has managed really well is the schedule. Uh, we're actually on track to finish about six months ahead of the schedule that we had anticipated. So that's helped uh, you provide additional savings just through accelerated, accelerated uh, finishing. Uh, so yeah, overall, a uh, pretty successful project. I, I think we did a good job managing the issues that we knew. Uh, thankful for Marcus and his advice, the extensive exploration that they did. And with that, I think we'll open it up to questions. Yeah, I, I got three part question. Um, what was the allowable settlement settlement limit and basis for that? And who owned the rest of that was clear? Yeah, we so so the question is what was the allowable settlement um, limit and also who owned the risk for that? So we ended up, I believe, we ended up with a half inch settlement and, you know, concern being the masonry structures right along the alignment. Um, and based on the soils, we thought that was achievable and actually it was achieved. And really once we, if we met triggers, I think 75% of that is when they were supposed to, you know, immediately notify us and, and we would work out what, what needed to happen. I don't remember all the triggers that honestly that were built into the spec, but that's where we started. To add to that, my recollection is that we set out, so because that was going to be incidental to shoring, which we knew would be required everywhere, we could set out exactly where the settlement monitoring was needed. Uh, and we had an interval along the alignment based on the depths and things like that. Um, so that's kind of how we approached that portion of you know what the requirements were. Yeah, the question was if there was any impacts we saw during the project for cultural resources, and the answer is yes. You probably noticed there was a couple cultural resources folks listed as subconsultants. Uh, I would have loved to get into that more during the presentation because that was another very interesting part of the project. Um, but yeah, so we did a cultural resources plan during design, and we knew that there had been artifacts found in, at Renton High School during construction of the high school, which we, uh, we were doing water installation that included a service to Renton High School. Uh, so we knew we would be right along that area. We did have cultural resources monitoring uh, because of the scale of the project. The way we approached that was to identify areas of very high concern, for example, along in the high school, and then identify areas of what I guess more moderate concern. And in the areas of high concern, we had a cultural monitor out there full time, anytime construction was happening in the lower areas, um, they were on call. And they did a training with the contractor prior to any digging to identify when they needed to be called and that sort of thing. Um, and it, it surprised me, frankly, given the history of the area, they didn't identify anything. Um, there, there was, I believe, only one stoppage of work, uh, and they were able to determine that the materials found were probably like from the early to mid 1900s. It looked like something had been, I think it was like railroad ties had been burned and filled or something. Um, so that stopped work for a little bit. We. We did include some mechanisms knowing that there could be work stoppages in the specification because again we wanted to give the contract be fair to the contractor and if we're telling somebody to stop work uh, it's easier to set up a mechanism to pay for that ahead of time so i think we had a delay you know delays of up to two hours were incidental uh, and then anything beyond that we had force account items specifically for that delay 
hope, uh, yeah, hopefully that wasn't too much, but it's, it's certainly an interesting portion of the project. Hi guys, um, it is now our 20 minute break time, but if you wanna keep asking questions, I am okay staying a bit